Lynch is a member of the stupidly successful Boy Zone, one of the biggest boy bands in history. He's got a string of number one hits under his belt, and he's adored by middle-aged housewives the world over. But if you don't happen to be a middle-aged housewife, don't worry. You see, Shane is not exactly your ordinary boy band member. Nowadays, Shane whiles away the hours as a drifter. That's a type of motorsport. It's just beyond the edge. It's, 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 there's no room for error. I love it. It blows my mind. He seems to have the dream life, but this glamour is a long way from his humble childhood in North Dublin. I never had a dream or want or anything or any expectations of being a star or a famous kind of person. I was a pretty regular kid, pretty regular guy who got a lucky break. But what would have happened if Shane hadn't got that one lucky break? To find out, he's going to return to Dublin to do the jobs he did before he was famous. I'm a little bit apprehensive. I don't know what to expect. He'll see if he can still cut it as a lawnmower. Work as a mechanic in his dad's old garage. <laughs> and experience the delights of modern day petrol pumping. I don't want to be here at all. I think I've put petrol in a diesel car. Along the way, we'll learn about his bizarre childhood home. She wanted a cave. How he rode a horse to school. Came down here. Fighted up to the bike rack and went into school. And dabbled with the dark side. I got deeply involved in kind of a cult, Ouija board, seances, clairvoyancy. While he tries to discover who he would have been if Boyzone had never existed. It was 1990 and the world was in a terrible funk. Vanilla Ice and Gaza were considered cool. Poor people were losing their cool over the poll tax. And Linda Evangelista was refusing to get out of bed for anything less than a cool 10 grand. Nowadays, Shane Lynch doesn't get out of bed for less than 10 grand either. Trust us, we know. But 20 years ago, all he wanted was enough money to fill his beloved motorbike up with petrol. To raise the cash, he went relentlessly from door to door mowing lawns. Now we're sending him back to his grassroots to tender the gardens of North Dublin one last time as he tries to rediscover the old chain before he was famous when he was just a 14 year old schoolboy with a rusty lawnmower and a slightly dodgy haircut. I have to say, fantastic memories of cutting grass. Trapes in an old lawnmower around the estate that I used to live in, knocking on the doors, hoping and pleading they were going to give me a few pounds. I think today's going to be an interesting day. Like, I have no idea whether they're going to tell me to do one or whether they're actually going to let me cut our grass. We've got a bike on standby, but we're not going to let him ride it until he's knocked on some doors, mowed some lawns, and earned the petrol money. Hey, darling, you all right? Don't set that dog on me now. But the whole point of actually going around knocking on doors it was just to get some money to buy more petrol and to run the motorbikes. How are you, darling? No, I'm not looking for a cup of tea at all. I'm just wondering where you want your grass cut. The locals seem friendly enough, but nobody's willing to let him cut their grass. And if he's going to get to ride his bike, he desperately needs a lawn to mow. I just wonder if you need any grass. I see you haven't got any grass in the front there, but how are you looking? Oh, thank God for that. Can I just have a look and I give you a price? Yeah, no, well, I Is that all right? Just the side here, yeah? Ah, yeah. oh, sound, yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll do that for... That's four euro. How's that sound? That's fine, yeah? yeah? Okay. Spot on. Yeah. Thanks very much. Top negotiating, Shane. Four euros. Roughly half the minimum wage. In fairness now, I have to say, I've actually done him a good deal. I said four euro. It'll take me longer than I thought. I should have should have been a bit more, but I'll do him a favour anyway. Your first job for the while, sure. I'll use this one as practice.
mowing is going well and the old memories are flooding back. Memories of teenage romance and fridge magnets. Um, I had a girlfriend and what I remember, I was sitting in our kitchen one day and they had fridge magnets. Of a picture of the lads out to take that. I think my girlfriend said something like, oh, Robbie, he's gorgeous, I love him, this, that and the other. Now, I didn't like that one bit in fairness. I'm a jealous kind of lad. And I took that to heart. And every unsundry out of my mouth came out about that lad, about Robbie Williams. He's a, he's a dad, he's a and the other. Um, and pure jealousy, admittedly pure jealousy. And I have to say that, I always remember that moment. And I always remember being in a boy band. 17, 18, 19 years old. Boys on, blowing up the town, whatever, love me for a reason was at the time. And uh, young lads from Dublin shouting across the street, you this, you that, you other. And I remember being able to gather that moment and say, well, you know, I was there myself. I did that myself about some other lads, so I understand their pain. Born to be wild. <laughs> Shane is finding that lawn mowing has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. See, back in my day when I was cutting grass, there's no such thing as uh, swinging chairs and seesaws and what have you. They were all down the park. You didn't have them in the back garden in my day, you see. Trees as well, they're another luxury. Nobody was planting trees back in my day. They didn't have to ground anything. We had a straight cut lawn, it was easy enough to do. Despite the presence of luxury trees, Shane has enjoyed his morning's work. I realised I still like to be passionate about cutting grass. I still want the lines to be straight. I still want it to look real pretty and to have a finished end result, which I could stand back and go, yeah, that's complete. That's a lot. Let's go get paid. I'm all done, boss. Finished. I am, idiot. Do you want to have a look? Yeah. Great stuff. Happy enough? Great job, yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, you, friend. God bless you. Thanks. See you. And a good man. Take care. See you. Hold on a minute now. Come in, I'll show you. Now, this is what we call a good job. I gave the good man a price of four. I was hoping for the euro tip because it was looking nice and getting five. Ten euro, you can't beat that. I don't even have to knock on next door anymore. I can cruise on home and fill up that petrol can and we're all happy. And I think that's what goes about saying, putting a bit of heart and soul into a job. Not only do you get the money you're worth, you get a little bit extra. God bless you, sir. With his hard-earned mowing money in the tank, the teenage Shane had enough to fill his bike with petrol. Sadly, he didn't have a license to ride it on the road. And so now, just like back in 1990, we're making Shane push his bike up the long road to the beach. Just a long mile to go, that's all. Oh. I hate reenactments. I don't know what I was thinking of. 12 miles? I couldn't tell you exactly how many hours behind the lawnmower I would have had to do to uh, get some petrol money, but nonetheless, it was always worth it. All the hard work is done, all I have to do is go and enjoy myself. This is where it pays off. we had was a rucksack on our backs, a pint of milk, a stick of black or white pudding. That was our lunch and our dinner for the day. And a few cans of petrol. And um, when we ran out, we ran out. But we loved it. We, we just didn't want to do anything else. This is what we enjoyed doing. Woo! After good 10 years since I've ridden this beach, that was flipping awesome, man. Proper boys, now that's... That's what ticks all my boxes now. Proper, proper buzz. Thanks be to God for grass. And thanks be to God for lawnmower. Because if it wasn't for the grass and the lawnmower, I wouldn't be riding these old babies. Well worth well. What? Coming up in part two. Shane is put to work as a mechanic in his father's garage. And he tells us how he used to ride a horse to school.
but it was short-lived because that was not acceptable by the school at all. Words are all Shane Lynch, one-fifth of one of the most successful boy bands in history, is on a journey back into his past to find out what might have been if he'd never made it big. So far, he's found he can still cut it as a lawnmower and has joyfully wrecked a perfectly nice Irish beach by riding his scrambler on it. Coming home again. Shane has now lived in England for nearly half his life, a period during which Dublin has changed almost beyond recognition. I never changed with what was going on. I used to just arrive home and it has changed. And I think that slowly but surely separated me from, from this country. I really did miss, it's more my pals probably, it's more the social scene. Like all the boys I grew up with from school and stuff. It's the Grange Community College as it's called. That's a school which asked me kindly not to come back. I wasn't a troublemaker by all means. But my best memories are just pulling up on me BMX and me horse. Your horse? I was cutting a bit of grass and I think I earned, I was about 30 pounds I think it was, 30 punt back in the day. Um, went down to the, the local travelling community and bought a horse off them anyway. Had never ridden a horse in my life, just thought this would be great. No saddle, no reins, no nothing. And uh, get up on this horse, and so I couldn't even make it go. I, I sat on it for about 15 minutes, not knowing how to make this thing move. A bit of old rope, came down here, tied it up to the bike rack and went into school. But it was short lived because that was not acceptable by the school at all. How unreasonable. In lessons, Shane struggled with dyslexia, a condition that wasn't diagnosed until into his 30s. I did wonder why I couldn't pick things up. I did wonder why I couldn't read that book. I'm sure, I didn't know what dyslexia was. I just accepted I couldn't read and write and made my way through life without talking about it, or without saying to anyone I, could, I, I couldn't read or write. Nowadays, I have no problem saying, look, I can't read or write, simply because there's a reason for it, as opposed to before I just thought, well, maybe I am just being lazy. So that's kind of my school history. I have to leave this place. Move on, Mr. Lynch, is what they said. And that, that was my school days over. Lucky enough, went on to work for the father. It was 1991. Arnie was busily declaring he'd be back. Nirvana was storming the charts. And storming Norman Schwarzkopf was kicking a very bad man out of Kuwait. Meanwhile, Shane Lynch, having been kicked out of school at the age of 14, turned to perhaps the only man in Dublin willing to employ him, his father. Now he's come back to see if he can remember the skills that his dad taught him as an apprentice mechanic 19 years ago. This is my uh, father's garage. Great boss, actually. Um, fair when he needed to be fair and fair when he was, you know, in, in good form. With a bit of luck now today, he'll be easy on me. I'll go and find out. Grant. Ah, good to see you again. Oh. Good to see you, Dave. Are you ready to work? No. Was I, was I ever ready to get, work? Get your arse no. in <laughs> <laughs> well, You're going to be nice to me? said, bring you back to, to your start. Right. So there's your brush. There's me brush. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I remember the days. I'll tell you what, we'll have a cup of tea for us, I think. That sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> His first big challenge is tyre changing. For Shane, something of a blast from the past. One of the things we used to do, um, we used to get the old tubes and see how far we could blow them up. Right. We used to be in here with the airline on it, and we'd get the tubes up to this size, and we'd go standing in there with, behind, with the door shut, blowing them up, and the bang they used to make. There used to be some crack. Oh, you didn't know that about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. First things first, let's break on that one. Middle one. Um, middle. Right, now, this comes down somehow. Yeah, slide it down, put it up against it. That's it. There you go. 
I think he saw it in the beginning as a way to get out of school. When he yeah. asked when he asked me for the job. I definitely did. Could he come and work? I don't know how much of that whole story you know, but I, I had spent a summer on a family holiday. I meant to be going back to school, but I wasn't allowed because I was kicked out. And I think, I was, yeah, I spent every day waking up in that morning. Today's the day I'm going to ask you. Today's the day I'm going to ask you. You know, dying to do it, but so, so scared of you saying no. Because if you said no, that means I had to go and now tell you that. I can't go, well, I can't go to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, I was hoping for the, the yes before we even had to get into any of that. But I remember being in the, in the old high ace we had. That's right. And I put my head through the curtains. Da. I don't really like school. Any chance of a job? OK, son. Thanks. And I put my head back behind the curtains. Well, and that went, was it. <laughs> I stressed out. Two months stressed out coming to September, and that's all it was. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Dad. But sure, I was thrilled, because the plan was for this to be the family business. And it still could be, like, if you ever get stuck with the singing. Like, you can always, <laughs> as you can see, he's still quite good, so he can always come back. <laughs> Shane seemed to be settling into the old routine rather well. And so, just for a laugh, we invited along this bloke. His old school friend, Fran. I need a bit of work done, kid. This is my new wheels, you know. You could have come in any faster, could you? <laughs> I'm treating the wife. I heard you back in town. Need a good mechanic. That's the crack, you know? <laughs> Long time since you had the tools. I need a lunacy. What's the crack? How many years I know you? Uh, 20, now 21. And as you say, nothing's changed with this guy. He's, st he's still flat out, still come in smoking, you know what I mean? Can you hear something down there? Can I hear something? Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing about these boys, they come in on a wind-up, you know? You wouldn't know what they'd be having yet. And the only reason why I ever passed an exam is because I sat beside him. Um, I See, had, I had the brains, he had the looks, you know. Pure forgery was what it was. I know, you know? I wanted to be in a boy band, but I'd rather work for a living, <laughs> you know. I love going to work. Well, I'm, not, I'm not handsome, but I'm dead cool, though, you know what I mean? Forget. He's sort of handsome, but he's got a spazzy run. He has his one fault, he runs like a spaz. No, I'll tell you how I run, like, that's, that's not PC, <laughs> you can't say that. I run like, uh, what, what's his name out of Bladen? John, not John, John Travolta in Greece, was it Greece? He's got a school with jocks up here, right? Simon Cowell, right? And he always had the fold up, right? <laughs> and he always had like slip ons that just didn't even fit him. I think it was Daz. Boys like Franco, you know, you, you go off around the world, you tour around the world, and you come home. And it, it's the same crack. You pick up like nothing's ever changed. And that's why you stay. <sighs> that's why you stay, um, you know, close to your friends and stuff. Uh, good pals are always good pals. Isn't that right, son? That's right, son. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Come on, go <laughs> well, you <load> up. <laughs> Shane was happy blowing up tyres and making cups of tea. It was 1994. The Channel Tunnel was opening. Tony Blair was taking charge of the Labour Party, and Britpop was about to take hold. Meanwhile, Shane was about to launch a musical revolution of his own. A friend had come up with a radical idea to start an Irish boy band. And soon, the two had an appointment to meet pint-sized pop impresario Louis Walsh. There was only one problem. He needed the morning off work. Now, I'm scared, you know, asking him this question, because rain, hail, sleet, snow, it doesn't matter. In this business, you come to work. So to ask him for time off was a big deal. Busy, busy garage. But nonetheless, I built up the courage. Da, uh, I need to go see a manager. I'm going to be in a band. Is that right, son? So, yeah. Right. Tell me something, he says. Do you sing? No, da. What instrument do you play, son? I don't play an instrument. Right. What are you going to do in this band? I'm not really sure. You better be back by two o'clock. In 1993, at the tender age of 17, Shane recklessly cast aside his promising career as a car mechanic, throwing it all away to start a new job as a pop star. Auditions were held, and before he knew it, Shane found himself thrust into the limelight as Boyzone were infamously announced to the world on Ireland's Late Late Show. The thing about it is, though, Gabe, we only got together last night. <laughs> right? We only, we only, the final we auditions were last night, and we only found out the word tonight that we were together. So. We got it together in the dressing rooms for a half an hour. So what you see tonight was only rehearsed for a half an hour. I'm going to be the new Irish. 
pop group. They're going to be the new Irish pop group That's right. at the Teeny Bopper Market. Teeny Bopper Market. Yes, I see. It had been a curious start, but the band had something special. Shane was joined by Ronan, the blonde, beautiful Irish one. Stephen, the short, gorgeous Irish one. Keith, the tall, dark, handsome Irish one. And Mikey, the Irish one. They played their first ever gig at this pub in Nass, a venue with round tables. Yeah, this place, um, it, it actually looks the same. You know, 17 years ago, same table and chairs. I remember them uh, specifically being round. Hmm, like a circle. Yeah, there's some good memories actually, real good memories. As I remember it, this is, was our, this was our dressing room. Yes, the gents toilets. So this would have been all blocked off and this was our backstage. You know, we'd be getting changed. We had um, like orange boiler suits was our outfit, let's call it. And you know, we didn't care we were in a toilet. This was not glamour by all means, but this was our backstage room. And we were all buzzing, we're all excited, we're all scared, and everyone's just starting to freak out and all panic. And I was always the one who just would have sat in the corner. I'd be very mellow, very calm on the exterior, but inside just freaking out, knowing I'm about to go through that door. A little prayer. I mean, right, lads, we're on. Out the door. Pretty much, you know, there would have been people lying around here. And when it got to this point, smoke everywhere. So let alone just these round tables trying to find your way through, it was almost an impossible task to get over here. But nonetheless, I think we were so excited about it. We did, anyway. We got here in one piece. And as we, as we landed, let's call it, nothing. I mean, you could see absolutely nothing. We actually did the full routines we had to the songs, even though nobody could see us or we couldn't actually see each other. Um, it was hilarious, absolutely hilarious. But I think at the same time, <laughs> that's a bit of what it was like, yeah, absolutely. At the same time, I kind of loved the fact that nobody could see me. I was on stage, it was a concert, I could hear the people out there, the, the atmosphere was electric, and it was a perfect scenario for me. Nobody could see me and I couldn't see them, and away I was having a good old time. And as it all cleared, there was the, the family, the, the friends, and everyone who came to see us, and it was amazing. We were superstars, you know? Coming back here now, it's, it's a great feeling. It's an absolute great feeling. And in the last couple of years, we've come back to arenas, me and the lads done, done arena tours, and standing there is, is a wow factor. And it's a, you know, it's a vast kind of outlook on what Boyzone has become. But coming to the simplicities of this is, is just a, a way better feeling, actually. So pretty much the gig had ended. And when we came off the stage, people were everywhere at this point, everyone had been up out of the chairs, they've come forward, they're standing at the stage. Um, and I think me and the boys, were, we were frightened. So we came back into our dressing room. Lads, how, how are we gonna get out of here? How can we possibly go through the crowd? How can we go through the audience? We're gonna get destroyed. We had no idea, you know, we were just so built up about it. But yet, all, all it was was mummy and daddy out there and the sisters just waiting to say, well done lads, that was a great old gig, but no, we're all freaking out thinking, we're, oh, the fans, the fans. So we organised the car at the back here um, to pull around, and right enough, there we are, giving each other bunties out the window, car waiting, the engine running. So we didn't even say goodbye or thank you or nothing to our friends and family. We were just superstars, rock stars, this was it, we'd left the building. Let the reason be love. Coming up in part three, we visit the cave that Shane used to call home. My mother loves everything very different. And watch him happily get to work in a petrol station. And out of all the things I've done, this one, I'm really not looking forward to. 
Shane Lynch is on a journey back into his past as he attempts to do the jobs he did before he was famous. When he blew up tires in his father's garage, rode his scrambler on the beach and lived here, in frankly the weirdest house in the entire world. No, honestly, you've got to see this. Um, I don't really know where to start when it comes to this house. It's a proper madhouse now. My mother loves everything very different. She wanted a cave. Um, so this guy comes in anyway and uh, <laughs> comes up with this idea of how to build a cave indoors and that's, you know, that's what she, the kind of stuff she liked to create and inside the cave is a, an inside waterfall and a small stream and all our collection of madness from Bambi's to foxes to ornamental statues. It's, it's like, I guess you come home and as a kid growing up here, been yay big. You know, you, you feel like you're, you, you could run 100 metres across this, across this room, but as an adult coming back here, everything's just so tiny and so small um, and humble, I guess, you know? Go back upstairs, and, or go upstairs rather, and see, see what the old room was like. And, uh, yeah, I don't know much different. That's when I was 13 years old, when I started to really get in heavily into hip hop and stuff, so yeah, NWA sprayed on my roof. Uh, that would have been my first record I imported. So I was hooked into hip hop. Um, and I was, yeah, I started importing all sorts of uh, hip hop stuff from America. And um, I used to record them on a tape and sell them in school. Um, technically that's very illegal and I could be prosecuted, but nonetheless, I did do it. So thank you, NWA. This is a fairly normal estate we live in, but yet again, my mother and father decided that, sure, why, why live in a hot country and all that and swimming pools and we can, when you can have one here. So they built this, as we call the shed. And then my mother again, all, all sorts of old memorabilia from concert stuff from all my different sisters in different bands. Shane is not the only Lynch to have tasted music success. In fact, when it came to 90s Irish pop sensations, his parents' marital bed was like a well-oiled production line. Tara, the eldest, was in Fab. Naomi was one half of Buffalo G. And the twins, Kiwi and Adele, had four number one singles with Bewitched. That's a foul. It was Shane who achieved fame first. And as Adele remembers, it was a fame that quickly affected the whole family. All right, good break. There was a few crazies. I remember them coming into the house and pretending they needed to pee just to rob some toilet roll. <laughs> just to go, I got you just toilet roll. And there wasn't even signed or anything, just Jack's roll. Did anyone ever ask you to sign Jack's roll later on in life? I have to say, when it comes to actually giving autographs and stuff, people do come up with crackers or things. They lose their mind, you know what I mean? It's just anything, anything at the given time. I hear me sandwich, you know? Come, no, you're kidding me I didn't get that shot. I remember the first time seeing you is like on a huge concert now, I suppose it was Wembley or something. I remember crying. I remember like just... Did you? Yeah, oh I did. I was so just this overwhelming feeling of just proudness and like, oh my God, this is Shane. Oh my God, Miss Q, you're kidding me. Eventually, oh. after much Miss Queuing, the game limps to a miserable end. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Shane can get on with doing the jobs he did before he was famous, like being a petrol pump attendant. Shane worked the pumps from the age of 13, when the job description was very different. Back then, you would draw your car into the garage, and a diligent-looking lad would shuffle faithfully out, exchange polite conversation, and fill the car up for you. Now, like a man from a bygone era, we're sending him to work in this garage to see if the millionaire pop star can still connect with the ordinary man on the street. Only he's not really in the mood. Nobody comes to this garage thinking they're gonna get service. And for me to go and ask somebody, I feel so hor horribly awkward because they're gonna look at me like, what are you asking me that for? It's it, it just, there's no relation here to what I used to do and how this feels. So I, I don't like it one bit, I'm, I'm really feeling crap about it and out of all the things I've done this one 
I'm really not looking forward to. Shane's not happy, but he's contractually obliged to continue, and so, reluctantly, he gets to work. Right. Welcome to Topaz Glasnevin. Thank you. Great to have Good you to working you, here. Boss. Great to have you working. Um, for the next couple of hours, just want you to serve customers with the fuel, okay. petrol and diesel. No um, hassle. Always make sure that you put the right fuel into the car. We don't want any mishaps, you know. No problem, just be pleasant to the customers. Hello, good morning. Please Enjoy. and thank you. So easy. Just smile at the customers and do not, under any circumstances, put petrol in a diesel engine. What do you want? Petrol. How much do you want? Full. Fill her up. You go on in and see the, the attendant there and I look at you. Truthfully, I'm having a bad day. I feel crap. I'm knackered. I'm tired. I don't want to see you. I don't want to speak to anyone today. But as soon as I am introduced to someone, there's a switch that goes on, and it is work mode. I guess that's what's been in the music industry or the public eye is all about. It's about turning on the charm. Having resigned himself to his fate, the superstar gets to work charming his adoring public. Hey, man, I look after you. Give it a pop there. That's right, yeah. I used to work up... Shane is my name. I used to walk up in a garage up the road, you know. In the good old days when you had personal touch, you know what I mean? So smooth. Do you want me and you in it? No, I'm you sure? No, Has, have a good day, all right? Thank Take you. care, love. Thank you. Drive carefully. It's all right, you're grand. You want in there, pay for the other sort, you Good man. All of a sudden, I don't feel that bad anymore. But people are nice here. You know, and they like the chat, and they're like, I know you from the telly and all that stuff. But even if they didn't, they still have to crack with you. They still have a laugh and a joke with you. And that's, that's, I think that's great about the personal touch and customer service. Grand. Grand, yeah. After all, all he had to do was put the right fuel in the right engine. Except, unfortunately, Shane just filled that last diesel engine full to the brim with petrol. Which, if you didn't already know, is a very bad thing. Would you believe the, the classic thing? You could, uh, the biggest mistake you could possibly make is to, is to put the wrong fuel. And I think I put petrol in a diesel car. It couldn't get any worse for me. I knew today was a bad day. I don't think the chap is a bit happy at all now, in fairness. But uh, A.B. Grant, a little pet on the head and a stroke. He'll be on his way. The car owner didn't get a stroke and a pat on the head, so to fix Shane's mistake, he was forced to call Bobby O'Hayes, Dublin's go-to guy for avoidable petrol pump mishaps. Where is he anyway? I think he ran away. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> but uh, we should have been able to sort out. Is this his car? No, it's this poor man's car. This is your car. It's not even his own car. You can send the bill to Shane. I'm sure he'll pay the bill, no problem. That's great. It's on you, man. Yeah, if you can find him. The little man has flushed the engine clean, but will it start? Just. Should be uh, some white smoke coming out the back of the there. Should be cleaner off now. After three hours of waiting, the customer finally gets on his way. Another happy recipient of the Shane Lynch personal service. So far, Shane has proved he's a pretty good lawnmower, a half-decent car mechanic and an appalling petrol pump attendant. But since Shane got famous at the age of 17, he's run out of jobs he used to do. So we decided to see how far he could have taken his passion for motor cars by pitting his skills against a team of elite mechanics at Renault Formula One in Oxfordshire. Here's your kit. You're going to get changed. And we'll see you shortly. <laughs> OK. Thanks very much. OK. I'm extremely lucky that I, I, I get to do anything I've done in life other than be a car mechanic, I think. And that's in all opportunities that I take from... Uh, from simply just being in a band. And even getting in that band, it, I never dreamt I'd be traveling the world in music. Um, someone just said to me one day, look, y you have a particular type of look, would you like to be in a band? And I said, yeah, I said, that sounds good to me. And, I, and, and that was a blessing in itself, which led on to all my amaz amazing experiences when it comes to, oh, I'm sitting in the back of an F1 truck, 
putting their kit on, you know? This, this, is, this is the boy's kit. I shouldn't be wearing this kind of stuff. I shouldn't have been allowed to be in these kind of places. It was never meant for me. I'm a little bit nervous. Keep the wheel nice and square. Take it off. As you can see the disc, the caliper and the pads there. Just remove this part of the brake deck. Okay. To expose the caliper. When I'm in my own garage, tinkering with whatever I'm tinkering with, it's just me, a spanner and a nut and a bolt. And there's nothing else that bothers me. And I love it. It's normal to be tinkering with a car, where my life that I lead is not very bloody normal. We know. You used to live in a cave. Once upon a time, I got a little bit emotional about a car, which uh, I don't mind telling the story, because uh, it's the truth. I, uh, I sold the car I had for about, mm, uh, about 15 years, and I loved it. I cherished this car. It was my first dream car, my first supercar and all that. And uh, when it actually left my driveway, I swear to God, I cried. I actually got, I got that emotion, I cried. I actually cried and I, I'm a little bit uh, happy about that because it shows my passion and love for cars. But at the same time, I wouldn't tell too many people. we late for that now, wouldn't I? Have you ever burst into tears over a car? I can't say I have, no. <laughs> no. With Shane grappling with his emotions, it's now time for a spurious TV challenge. A Formula One pit stop is arguably the most pressurised motor mechanics job on earth. The slightest mistake and a race can be lost. To compete with the best, Shane needs to change a tyre in an eye-boggling 2.3 seconds. This is massive. Start again, Bob. He messed that one up. Catching it. Two races we've lost. Me in the way. And your time is 2.68, <laughs> which is quite good. Well done. Oh man, I'm buzzing. Does it make you sweat a bit? I'm proper buzzing, you know what I mean? Let the masters be the masters and I bow down to them. Thank you, boys. You did very well. I thought he was really going to struggle and he came through sort of with flying colours. You could tell he's had spanners. Yeah, he's good. What's that even mean? I've always had the passion and the love for it, um, but I don't think I ever would have got the opportunity because I don't know anyone in F1. A little old me from Dublin, you know? Coming up in part four, Shane explains how he got into the occult. My mind went to a kind of a, a sinister place, occult, Ouija boards, seances. And tells us all about his new life as a drifter. I, I love it, it blows my mind. Shane Lynch is staggering onward through a journey into his past as he tries to discover what might have been if he hadn't joined Boyzone at the age of 17. So far we've discovered he illegally copied music and he used to live in a cave. But Shane couldn't have us leave Ireland without telling us about how he used to be a Satanist. So we all headed off down to the tattoo parlour to find out all about it. My tattoo on journey's been a, a hell of one, I think, a hell of one. It's more than just a one off thing for me. It's a canvas, my body is a canvas. My kind of upper left hand side is my motorsport. My right hand side, chest overwards, is uh, music. My left hand leg has kind of a gambling theme. And, and I think life is a gamble. You've got dice, you've got lucky, you know, like horseshoes, shamrocks. And also my own hand is on my leg, throwing in the dice. So you're the one who makes those choices. Although a million miles away from his job as a mechanic, Shane's new career as a musician came with its own unique pressures. Boys on and stuff had come to its toughest time where we were most famous or it was most stressful or we were working uh, most hours. And my mind went to a kind of a, a sinister place, I suppose. I got deeply involved in kind of a cult, Ouija boards, seances, clairvoyancy. And all of that just kept taking me to darker places all the time. I 
I guess even when it comes to my hands, you know, I've got ropes, I've got chains, and all this stuff kind of represents being bound mentally to certain situations that I thought I could never get out of. As his fame grew, he began to deliberately cultivate a wild child image in order to keep the public at bay. I was a shy individual, and how do I not have people approach me to talk to me? Because I didn't even want to talk to people. You know, I didn't want to talk to them because I didn't know what to say to them. And I found power in darkness. Soon, Shane's dark moods were alienating those closest to him. So rather than my friends and my family understanding me, they started to fear me, and that's not what I was trying to create. The four other lads in Boys on, they didn't even know what I was going to do. It was the year 2000. A borderline simpleton called George W. Bush became the most important man in the world. And fuel protests were causing chaos across the country. But it all quickly paled into insignificance when Boyzone announced they were going their separate ways. Shane increasingly struggled to fill the void. I was very angry. I was an angry guy. And I can only imagine I was angry because, sure, I didn't have my family and friends around me anymore. I was lonely. So therefore, how do I get out of this? And if there's a dark side, which clearly there is, uh, then there has to be a light side. And I stepped into that journey of God, and the more I went towards the light, it's the more I found myself actually been that little bit of a better person. And right enough, a year, two years later, as my father says, I came back, I came home. Daddy Al. This is a bad name, can't we? What is it though? Well. Without a doubt, back in the years of Boys On, I was a proper little shithead and thought I was bigger than I really was. But that's a learning curve, you know, and it's nice to be able to look back at that and I'll laugh at it now for sure, but I have no problem apologising to those who I've upset in the past. We always knew that pressures were there in the music business, etc., etc. And he was always told, when you get your head together, just come back. He doesn't really like to admit it, but he is, at times, a chip off the old block. And uh, I always said to the family, he's just going to wake up some morning and go, right, can I say fuck? Because he'll say, <laughs> he, he's going to wake up some morning and say, fuck that, and he'll be back. And that's exactly what he did. When I was travelling the world, one of the biggest things I missed was just being in the garage. The simple things, I guess. And it was, it was great, you know, we're, we're cruising through Berlin and there's this, that and the other and there's all sorts of beautiful sights we're, we're seeing and, you know, Red Square and it's all fabulous. And realistically, all I wanted to do was be back in the garage working on an old car. I think if I hadn't have went forward with the whole Boys Own project, Boys Own would have cracked on without me. It was just a chance. So coming back and working in a garage would have been perfectly fine for me because of how I was reared. You know, if you don't achieve, you crack on, you find something else. And I, this, was, this was my dream, not being a pop star. Right, standing under this car here now, this is my dream. And this is all I ever wanted to do. So this was good enough for me. Yeah, yeah, stand on the top of the field, Taught him well. An eighth of a turn. Problem solved. Switching off. Ah, leave her running just to be sure, to be sure. Aye. Well, that seems to be the problem solved. Shane Lynch's journey into his past is almost at an end, and he's happily returning to his new job as a drifter. Quick roll call. Declan, Keith, Shane. Yep. I don't think I would have had the pleasure to be in this league of motorsport without Boys On. I started racing cars uh, properly about 98, 99, and then somebody asked me that I hear drifting. I've seen it, I've heard of it, but I didn't actually think it was full on real until I, I arrived in Silverstone on a practice day and my jaw just hit the ground. I could not believe what these guys were doing in these cars. And I had to learn, I had to know how to do it, I had to become a drifter. Ever since then really, I, I've never looked back. This is my fourth, fourth year in a drift car and I, I love it, it blows my mind. got out of this whole journey was pure appreciation. 
Being allowed to revisit your past is an amazing thing. Yeah. That's, that's an opportunity like that nobody really gets. Like, if I wanted to step back into a garage that I once worked in, grass that I once cut, as the man I am today, it's a great thought, it's a great idea, but no one actually does it. I haven't loved every minute of it. I have truly enjoyed a lot of it. But to be allowed to revisit it, I got a lot of positivity because I liked my past. I liked the person who I was. I reckon so I'd be very, very happy just being a car mechanic in Ireland if I didn't know anything else. And I know that I wouldn't be uh, part of any race team if it wasn't for boys only. It's uh, above and beyond all my expectations. And dreams do come true.